Located on the Navasota River near the Brazos is a small town known as Navasota, Texas. It was explored by the French explorer La Salle in the late 1600s, but was not officially a town until 1854 when the first post office was established. In 1859, the railroads would make their way into Navasota, driving economic growth, and the explosion of agriculture in the railroad would allow the population to grow to nearly 4,000 people by the year of 1900. Currently, Navasota encompasses 6.1 square miles of land and is home to around 7,000 people. Its school district includes one high school, one junior high, one intermediate school, and two elementary schools while serving approximately 362 square miles of land, extending past the rural communities of the surrounding townships. The late 1800s saw the establishment of many schools in the area. It was not until the late 1920s that students really desired a new high school. Conditions were considered to be overcrowded and unsanitary, but academic excellence in the district needed to ensure its future by building a new high school. In 1928, the first appearances of a desire for a new high school appeared, with the students being the voice of the community. An article appeared in the Navasota School newspaper on February 10, 1928, that was titled, When Will We Have a New School Building? While it was only three short paragraphs, over the next few years, the Navasota students would voice their opinion by publishing many articles on the matter of creation of a new school. Ultimately, a bond election would be held May 4th, 1929 to determine the fate of a new school. In efforts to get the bond issue voted upon, the students received help from the Kiwanis Club and the Chamber of Commerce. This allowed for a voice to be heard within the community that was not just coming from students of the high school. The school bond carried by a big odds with 98% of the voters in favor of the new school building. Details of the building and the proposals were taken over the summer months of 1929. The proposal from Giske and Harris Architects was accepted for the future high school building. The building itself would be an $85,000 venture appropriated from a $130,000 school bond. In the plans, a two-story brick building with well-lit spacious classrooms, a large library that would be adjoined by accommodating study hall, would be built on the land donated from the Brosens. The two-story structure would be constructed of brick and reinforced steel concrete. On the west side of the building, there would be a manual training shop classroom and a drawing room. The south side of the building, facing Washington Avenue, would have three classrooms and the superintendent's office. Along the east side of the building would be the library and the study hall. The back of the building would see the boys' locker rooms, the girls' and boys' restrooms, the girls' locker room, a boiler room, and entrances to the gymnasium that was enclosed within the structure. The second floor of the building would consist of a few classrooms and laboratories. The home economics department was located on the west side of the building with a food laboratory, a clothing laboratory, a dining, and a fitting room. The front of the building was where the science department could be found. The chemistry and the physics lab bordered the science lecture room that was located directly above the entryway. Two recitation rooms were found on the east side of the building along with the principal's office. The back of the building saw a creation of a balcony or bleacher section for the gym that was located on the first floor. The bricking on the front of the building was not only for the structural purposes but decorative as well. Brick sills would decorate a majority of all the windows of the building and wooden doors with inset windows would provide an added aesthetic to the design of the school. The design was clearly allowed to allow for a multi-purpose facility that would accommodate the expected growth of the school in the last many years. 85 years later, the building is still standing with nearly all the original architecture and character that Giske and Harris designed. The two-story structure saw no significant change for the remainder of the decade. In conjunction with the Works Progress Administration, Joe Bruley, the city engineer, helped design a gym and football stadium to serve the school. The original football facility from 1935 is still in use today and is known as Bruley Field in honor of Joe. It remains in use as a soccer stadium for the high school. The high school would undergo no significant changes over the next few decades structurally, but much would change inside the classroom. 
The 1960s saw the integration with George Washington Carver High School, the African American high school that was located in the town. In 1964, a Freedom of Choice plan was enacted, and by 1969, all students were desegregated within the city of Navasota. Dr. John C. Webb was the superintendent at the time and vividly remembers the incident going down very smoothly and resuming school as normal the following year. In 1976, the days of the high school at the two-story building would be no more. The junior high would come in with Principal Hollis Hood at the helm. Mr. Hood recalls starting one day at the old George Washington Carver High School that at that time was the junior high and finishing it at the two-story building on the same day. Students were responsible for moving their own desks by backing them up to a moving truck and then getting on a bus, unpacking them, and resuming the school day as normal. The 1980s and 90s saw a transitional time for the old two-story building. The 1930 high school would become the junior high in 1976 with seventh and eighth graders roaming the halls. Fifth and sixth graders would soon follow as it would be known as the Navasota Intermediate School. Sometime in the 1980s, the old enclosed gymnasium would now become the library and the library would be converted into new classrooms. This was to allow for the expansion of more grades to be able to use the building, and in 1997, a plan was enacted to turn this into the district's central office. Familiar faces such as Dr. John C. Webb and Hollis Hood can still be seen around the district today. Others, such as Lillian Wesley and the current librarian of the high school, Nancy Bullion, share their tales of their times as teachers, librarians, and students in the school. On May 10th, 2014, a bond election will be held 85 years, six days after the initial one for the 1930 high school. This bond election will see renovations and repairs for the 1930 building, totaling over $3 million. The building has been a rock for the town and the school for over eight decades and continues to play a vital role in the school system. Whether this structure was a high school, a junior high, an intermediate school, or an administration building, it has been a representation of every Rattler that has passed through its halls. This two-story schoolhouse built in 1930 is not just wood, steel, concrete, and brick, but a symbol for an educational persistence that can be found in Navasota Independent School District.